Could we get started, everyone? I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I think I'm confident in predicting that what you're being interrupted for will be worth being interrupted about. Um, thanks for all for, your, for coming out tonight in uh, uh, what seems to be our weekly uh, snowstorm of the season. Uh, I'm Kerry Dunn. I'm the president of the New York City Bar Association. Uh, this is a terrific night for all of us, of course, uh, as we have the honor to be in the presence of not one, but two Supreme Court justices. Uh, I haven't checked the uh, history books, but that may be uh, a record here uh, in this room, uh, both of whom braved the snow uh, and the train tonight from D.C. to be here, so we're especially honored that they uh, made that sacrifice to come. Um, as, you, as you can imagine from looking around, the uh, response to our invitation about this event was uh, immediate and overwhelming. Uh, within, I think, minutes, it was sold out, and there were tickets being sold on uh, StubHub and other places <laughs> like that. Um, so I apologize that the seating is tight, uh, but it is usually the case uh, given the uh, uh, the honoree, uh, and we wanted to give as many people as possible the chance to be here. Um, we're especially happy that there are reportedly uh, over 100 law students in the crowd. Welcome, law students, um, perhaps with a future Supreme Court justice or two among them. Um, just so you know, and as many of you do know, the City Bar established this uh, lecture in Justice Ginsburg's name uh, a number of years ago to celebrate her groundbreaking contributions to the advancements of women's rights, her achievements also as a lawyer, law professor, and judge. Um, this is our 12th Ginsburg lecture, and uh, Justice Ginsburg herself has been involved in every one of them um, since the inception of the lecture series. So we're very happy for her continued presence and dedication. Um, she's obviously been a voice for justice and gender equity and civil rights for many, many years. Um, in terms of her own background, uh, and just not to spoil the, uh, uh, the agenda, but uh, she will be introducing tonight the other justice whom we're honored to have uh, be here tonight, Justice Elena Kagan. So I, I'm not going to steal the thunder of Justice Ginsburg by talking about Justice Kagan. I'll leave that to her. Um, Justice Ginsburg uh, was uh, top among the women in her class at Cornell University before attending uh, Harvard Law School, where at the time she was only one of nine women in the class of 1959, before she uh, transferred and graduated from Columbia Law School. Upon graduation, she clerked for the Admiral, uh, Honorable Edmund Palmieri of the Southern District of New York. In 1963, she became the second woman to, woman to join the faculty at Rutgers University School of Law. Later at Columbia Law School, she became the first tenured woman on the faculty. And while there, she founded the Women's Rights Project of the ACLU. And as director of that project, she argued many court cases, including many before the US Supreme Court, uh, which challenged sexual stereotypes and paved the way for better opportunities for women. Uh, also during her time at Columbia, she served, I'm very proud to say, uh, on our, our City Bar uh, Executive Committee, basically our board of directors, from 1974 to 1978. Um, prior to her appointment to the Supreme Court, of course, she also served from 1980 to 1993 on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. It's now my privilege to uh, invite Justice Ginsburg to the podium to induce, uh, introduce our other distinguished speaker, Justice Kagan. After that, just so you know, um, I'll come back up uh, because we will have a Q&A following Justice Kagan's remarks at which, uh, for a limited amount of time, uh, people in the audience will be allowed to ask questions of either justice um, uh, that might occur to you, and we'll help to moderate that. So thank you, Justice Ginsburg. I'm glad to see that the snow didn't discourage the members of this intrepid audience. And it is my 
great joy to introduce to you this evening's lecturer, my dear colleague, the most honorable, Elena Kagan. Justice Kagan has worked in the law in just about every capacity. She has served all three branches of our government, sampled private practice at Williams and Connolly, and most prominently, devoted many years to legal education. First, a professor at the University of Chicago, then at the Harvard Law School. She became Harvard's dean in 2003 and served until 2009 the year President Obama appointed her Solicitor General of the United States. Attendees at court sessions since Justice Kagan's appointment in 2010 have seen what a wise and witty participant she is at oral argument. Her opinions display the best of the careful jurist art she never seeks to carry the day by sweeping opposing arguments off the table, and her style is irresistibly engaging. The reader is apt to think from her clarity, fluency, and good humor that she was assigned an altogether easy case. But I know the hours and hours one must spend to make it sound that way. In whatever she endeavors, Elena has been a star performer, first woman to become dean of the Harvard Law School, first woman to be confirmed as Solicitor General, and in 1973, first girl to inaugurate a ceremony kin to a bar mitzvah at Manhattan's Lincoln Square Synagogue. <laughs> You may know of her White House service during President Clinton's administration, but you likely do not know that she was commandeered by the first branch for a special assignment in the summer of 1993. Then Senator Biden, who chaired the Senate Judiciary Committee, commissioned Elena to prepare him for my confirmation hearings. She may have read some of my writings, perhaps DC Circuit Opinions, briefs I authored or co-authored, articles I wrote in my law teaching days. I never asked, but I hope that chore did not include reading the stirring book I co-authored in the early 1960s, Civil Procedure in Sweden. more in the did you know category. <laughs> in the 1987 term, when now Justice Kagan clerked for Justice Thurgood Marshall, she was a regular reliable guard in pickup basketball games played at the top floor of our marble palace, the place familiarly known as the highest court in the land. <laughs> Her first year as a member of the court she showed how far she would go to foster collegiality. Under the tutelage of Justice Scalia, she became a fearless hunter. The personal trainer with whom she boxes has been my physical fitness guardian since 1999. He tells me she has the best jab, cross, hook, punch combination. <laughs> on the federal bench. <laughs> Elena accomplished an amazing feat at the Harvard Law School. A faculty once fractious began to work for the institution in harmony, and students once discontent began to like the place. How did she manage that transformation? Not so much by fundraising and constructing new buildings, although she was a champion at both. In her own words, I looked around for little things I could do, things that don't cost much money, don't take too much time, 
that you don't have to have a faculty meeting to do. Among things that fit that bill, she discovered, you can buy more student happiness per dollar by giving people free coffee than anything else. <laughs> As junior justice, she heads the cafeteria committee, a truly disheartening assignment. <laughs> There's not much one can do to make the fair better, but she found something she could fix even on a slim budget, thanks to Elena, a frozen yogurt machine daily dispenses sustenance that all can enjoy. <laughs> I will leave off with a characteristic example of her quick wit and good humor. At the hearings on her confirmation, Senator Lindsey Graham asked whether she thought Miranda warnings should be given to terrorists. For example, the infamous Christmas Day underwear bomber. The Senator prefaced the inquiry by asking then Solicitor General Kagan, where were you on Christmas Day? The nominee began to explain that it would be inappropriate to address an open question that might one day come before the court. The senator persisted. I just asked, where were you on Christmas? Elena's disarming response, Senator, like all Jews, I was probably in a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> With enormous pleasure, I invite you to join me in welcoming Justice Elena Kagan to the podium. Thank you, thank you. Oh, sit down. Justice Ginsburg deserves the standing O. I haven't done anything yet. <laughs> uh, thank you, Justice Ginsburg, Ruth, for that wonderful introduction. I think that uh, Christmas Day story is going to follow me every place I go. <laughs> There's nothing I'm ever going to write on the US Supreme Court <laughs> that's going to be so much quoted <laughs> as that line. But, um, but I'm, I'm go still going to try. Uh, thank you so much to the New York City Bar Association for having me. It's really an honor to be here to talk with all of you, uh, and especially because you've given me this wonderful opportunity to talk about one of the living giants of American law, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And I'm very grateful for that. So in my three and a half years on the court, serving with Justice Ginsburg, I've come to admire her really more and more each day as a judge, a colleague, and a friend. You know, they say that life on the court can be a little cloistered. And I didn't realize until recently that to folks on the outside, Justice Ginsburg is much more than that. To many of them, she is a hip hop icon. <laughs> I'm going to disappear from my first prop. <laughs> the notorious RBG. <laughs> They sell these, truly. <laughs> she is the subject of an opera, a comic book, a Tumblr, and a blog called the Ruth Bader Gins Blog. <laughs> I'm going to disappear now for my second prop. <laughs> she is a bobblehead. <laughs> bobblehead because, you know, the head bobbles, as you can see. Now here she is, this is pretty small and I know you won't be able to see it, but she is standing on the grounds of Virginia Military Institute, a college that, as it sounds though, as though many of you know, she along with some other members of the court made co-ed. And uh, this thing here is a safe and what, what she's doing here is she's pulling from the safe 
the 13 cents less per dollar that Lily Ledbetter was paid relative to her lowest paid male colleague. So that's Justice Ginsburg, the bobblehead. <laughs> There's also some reference to copyright law in here, but I'll spare you that one. <laughs> And did you know that BuzzFeed, BuzzFeed has a list of 19 reasons Ruth Bader Ginsburg is your favorite Supreme Court justice? <laughs> I thought 19, it was, it was, they were actually all pretty funny, but I thought 19 was maybe a little bit much, but I thought I'd give you a sample. So here are two of them. There are 17 more reasons why Justice Ginsburg is your favorite Supreme Court justice, but maybe you can make them up. After, after this is over, you can go talk with your friends and come up with your favorite 17 reasons. Now, it really makes absolute sense that Justice Ginsburg has become an idol for younger generations and especially for younger women, of whom I'm just delighted to see many, many uh, here. Her impact on America and American law has been extraordinary. And I think one way to see that impact clearly is by looking at the women who have served on the court. About 25 years separate the first two, Sandra Day O'Connor and Justice Ginsburg, from the next two, me and Justice Sotomayor. And in those 25 years, the world changed for women so that my and Justice Sotomayor's post-law school career paths were ever so much easier than those of our two predecessors. When Justice Ginsburg started out at Harvard Law School in 1956, she was part of only the seventh class to admit women. And that 500-person class, uh, as you've heard, did you use this number, had eight people? Or did you say nine? Nine. I don't know. One of us is right. <laughs> Could have been seven. <laughs> Could we settle on eight and a half? <laughs> the on-campus dorms were all for men, and in half of the classroom buildings, so were the restrooms. That meant if you had the misfortune to take a class, or still worse, if you had the misfortune to take an exam in, say, Langdale Hall, you had to make a mad dash across campus when the need struck. The dean at the time, Erwin Griswold, had a famous, or um, maybe I should call it infamous, tradition for the few women students who were there. Every year, he would invite all of the women in the first year class for a lovely dinner at his house. They all fit at one table, of course. Then, when dinner finished, Dean Griswold would usher everyone into the living room, where he would ask them, one by one, to explain what they were doing at the law school occupying a seat that could have been held by a man. Now, in fairness to my predecessor, who has gotten a lot of grief for this practice over the years, as you can imagine, I recently heard Justice Ginsburg give the story a charitable interpretation. Apparently, years later, Dean Griswold told her that he hadn't meant the question to be skeptical, much less unkind. He said he had asked the women about their plans just so that he'd have stories to tell the doubting Thomases on the faculty who were dubious about the school's decision to admit women. I don't know. <laughs> As a former dean myself, I admired the man's capacity to spin. <laughs> but I'm not sure I believe it. Justice Ginsburg was already a rock star. She shot to the top of her class. She was selected as an editor of the Harvard Law Review. 
But even being the notorious RBG wasn't quite good enough. The start of her third year, Justice Ginsburg made a request of the dean. Her husband, Marty, had just graduated from law school and started a job in New York, where he was diagnosed with a serious illness. So Justice Ginsburg asked Dean Griswold if she could complete her last year of law school at Columbia while still receiving a Harvard degree. Dean Griswold refused, saying if she was going to spend her final year at Columbia, that all she could get was a Columbia degree, not one from Harvard. Somehow she survived that deprivation. <laughs> she graduated from Columbia, getting the highest possible honors from that school as well. And now I'm just going to digress a bit from my story. Numerous subsequent Harvard Law School deans, including me, offered over the years to right Dean Griswold's wrong and to give Justice Ginsburg the Harvard Law School degree that she should have gotten years earlier. She always refused. I kind of thought out of an admirable loyalty to Columbia. But I heard her say a couple of years ago that Marty, her husband, had told her that she should hold out for the real prize, an honorary degree from Harvard University. <laughs> Marty was a very smart man, and Justice Ginsburg indeed received that honorary degree a couple of years ago. But back to my real story. Although Justice Ginsburg had excelled at two great law schools, she, like her future colleague, Sandra Day O'Connor, had a tough time finding a job. Law firms refused to hire her. One told her it already had a token woman. When she applied for clerkships, the great judges of the era declined even to consider her. Learned Hand said he didn't want any women in his chambers because he would be inhibited in their presence. Felix Frankfurter said he wouldn't break the Supreme Court's tradition of hiring only male clerks. But as you've heard, Justice Ginsburg ultimately did get a clerkship on the Southern District of New York, uh, uh, I think because the great Professor Gerald Gunther basically threatened a judge uh, and made uh, him hire her. And after that, she was hired by Rutgers Law School and became one of the first tenure-track female law professors in the country. But even that came with a string attached. Rutgers told her that she was going to be paid less than her male colleagues because, quote, your husband has a very good job. <laughs> now, against this striking background of gender bias, Justice Ginsburg, as you know, succeeded marvelously. She eventually became the first woman tenured professor at Columbia Law School. She founded the ACLU Women's Rights Project. She was appointed by President Carter to the DC Circuit Court of Appeals and by President Clinton to the Supreme Court. And she did all this while raising two children. The first, Jane, who is here tonight, was born just before Justice Ginsburg started law school. And Jane followed her parents into the law, becoming a Columbia Law Professor too and one of the country's foremost copyright scholars. The second, James, shared his mother's love for opera and is now the founder and president of a Grammy award-winning record label for classical music. I know that Justice Ginsburg would attribute her ability to have it all, at least in some significant part, to her husband, Marty. As everyone who knew Marty could tell you, he was a brilliant man, hilarious and witty, a world-class tax lawyer and chef, and an all-around mensch. When I was dean at Harvard, at a panel I was moderating once on work-life balance, Professor Carol Steiker, one of my colleagues, was asked by a, a student how she had managed to combine such a great career with such a great family life. And she gave a four-word answer, marry the right guy. I think Justice Ginsburg would agree, and she certainly found the perfect partner in Marty. But I don't think even Marty could make the path easy for Justice Ginsburg in the legal world of the 1950s and 60s. Every step of her way was marked by perseverance, grit, and downright courage. 25 years later, my experience was very different. 
When I graduated from law school in 1986, almost 40% of my classmates were women. Female law firm partners and law school professors weren't exactly the norm, but their numbers were growing, and they weren't thought of as tokens or curiosities. Almost all federal judges and justices were more than happy to hire the brightest women as their clerks. Although I won't say I never felt any bias, it was pretty easy for me to pick the path of my choosing. A couple of times, as you heard, I happened to be the first woman as dean at Harvard and then as solicitor general. And those firsts were meaningful and important. But it was essentially a fluke that they hadn't happened already. The dominoes were more than ready to fall. So what explains this gulf between Justice Ginsburg's experience and mine? In large part, the answer is simply Justice Ginsburg. As a litigator and then as a judge, she changed the face of American anti-discrimination law. More than any other person, she can take credit for making the law of this country work for women. And in doing so, she made possible my own career and later on the careers of many of today's devotees of the notorious RBG Tumblr <laughs> and the Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So I want to explore Justice Ginsburg's contribution by looking at six of her greatest hits. Three of the cases she litigated as a private attorney and three anti-discrimination opinions she's written as a justice. Together, I think they show the remarkable progress the country and the law have made thanks to Justice Ginsburg's efforts, even as they show that possibilities of backtracking remain very real. And they demonstrate as well another thing I want to talk about today, which is Justice Ginsburg's sheer excellence as both a lawyer and a judge. By picking these six cases, I don't mean in any way to diminish Justice Ginsburg's many other contributions to the law. As a law professor, she was a path-marking scholar of civil procedure and one of the first comparativists. Path-marking. Have you ever heard that word before? <laughs> it appears in about 30 Justice Ginsburg opinions. <laughs> Although it actually appears not to exist. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> Among her less well-known achievements, as she told you herself, she wrote, what I'm confident is the definitive American volume on civil procedure in Sweden. <laughs> and that's why when the Supreme Court faces a tricky question of Swedish civil procedure, <laughs> we always go straight to Justice Ginsburg. <laughs> As a judge, she has authored outstanding opinions on, among other subjects, federalism, statutory interpretation, separation of powers, and her favorite subject of all, civil procedure. And for the students in this room, or for the lawyers in this room, if any of you want a refresher course on personal jurisdiction, <laughs> I recommend you read Justice Ginsburg's trio of opinions in Nicastro, Goodyear, and Daimler. Right, right, and right. But today I want to focus on her contribution to women's rights, because however important personal jurisdiction is, <laughs> that's the that's the work that has most changed the world. To understand this contribution, it's important to have a sense of what the constitutional law of gender equality was like before Justice Ginsburg founded the ACOU Women's Rights Project in the early 1970s. And that's easy enough because it just didn't exist. As Justice Ginsburg has memorably put it, the Constitution was an empty cupboard for sex equality claims. The one exception was the 19th Amendment, which had given women the right to vote in 1920. Yet half a century later, the law was still riddled with gender distinctions, open, unabashed discrimination right in the text of many state and federal laws. And the Supreme Court had yet to declare a single one of those laws a violation of the Equal Protection Clause. Now, everyone is familiar with the great and heroic struggle that lawyers like Thurgood Marshall faced when litigating race discrimination claims in the 1940s and 1950s. And of course, 
there were difficulties that they faced absolutely unique to that effort. But even those lawyers could point to a handful of legal precedents paying lip service to racial equality. For the nascent women's rights movement, there was all but nothing. What Justice Ginsburg drew on instead was the rapid change that was occurring in social attitudes about women and their role in American life. And with that ongoing change in mind, she approached the cause of women's equality with a remarkably strategic mind. Justice Ginsburg's first brief before the Supreme Court was in Reed v. Reed in 1971. She has said that this case was perfect in the law, perfect in the facts. Her client was Sally Reed, who lived in Idaho with her son, separately from the son's father. Reed's son tragically committed suicide, and she filed a petition to administer his estate, which consisted of just a few items of personal property. The father then filed a competing petition to administer the estate. Idaho intestacy law at the time provided that, and I'm, and I'm quoting here again, males must be preferred to females. So that was that, as far as the lower courts were concerned. The father's petition was granted over the mother's. Justice Ginsburg saw the case as potential. The Idaho law was a relic from the 19th century, dating back to the days when women couldn't hold property apart from their husbands. Sally Reed had suffered a terrible injury, and the discrimination was unmistakable. When Reed's case made it to the Supreme Court, Justice Ginsburg took on the briefing. Even at a remove of 40 years, the brief Justice Ginsburg wrote strikes the reader as stunningly ambitious. It made the case for subjecting all classifications based on sex to the highest level of judicial review called strict scrutiny, at a time when not a single such classification had been invalidated by the Supreme Court. And the brief aimed to be more than a legal document. It tried to educate the court about social changes regarding the treatment and status of women. Our mission, Justice Ginsburg later said, was to educate and to spark judges and lawmakers' understanding that their own daughters and granddaughters could be disadvantaged by the way things were. In line with that goal, the brief began with a simple proposition. In very recent years, it said, a new appreciation of women's place has been generated in the United States. It marshaled an array of social science research to show that women were just as qualified as men to administer estates, just as the great Louis Brandeis had once used facts in the world to litigate for progressive causes at the turn of the 20th century. Some of the evidence Justice Ginsburg put before the court actually had to do with women's aptitude for managing homes, a sly attempt to appeal to the more conservative members of the court. The brief was littered with citations to literature, history, biography, and more, all tending to show both the appalling treatment of women over the years and the intrinsic injustice of sex-based discrimination. The brief even cited favorable decisions of the West German Federal Constitutional Court, not Sweden. <laughs> it cited uh, those decisions before it became verboten to consider such things, <laughs> because as Justice Ginsburg would later say, if our Supreme Court noticed what the West German Constitutional Court was doing, the justices might ponder, how far behind can we be? The court ruled unanimously in Sally Reed's favor. Its opinion was terse. In a few short paragraphs, it struck down the law as an irrational gender-based distinction, the first such ruling ever. Just as Justice Ginsburg's brief had argued, often in nearly the same words, the court held that the Idaho law was the very kind of arbitrary legislative choice forbidden by the Equal Protection Clause. However much Idaho wanted an easy way of selecting who could administer estates, the court said, the choice in this context may not lawfully be mandated solely on the basis of sex. The court did not go so far as to subject gender classifications to heightened scrutiny, as Justice Ginsburg had asked, but its broad language planted the seeds. Water's a long way away. 
feel like you have to do like a Marco Rubio <laughs> maneuver. <laughs> Justice Ginsburg's first oral argument came a year later in Frontiero versus Richardson. Her client in that case was Sharon Frontiero, a lieutenant in the Air Force. Frontiero's husband was a full-time student at a small college in Alabama. Under federal law at the time, a married male service member always qualified for a housing allowance, but a married female service member qualified only if she provided three-fourths of the family income. The theory, to the extent that there was one, <laughs> appeared to be that most women in the military were supported by their husbands and not the other way around and so the women didn't usually need a government subsidy. Frontiero fell just shy of the law's cutoff, and so she didn't get a housing allowance. In selecting this case, Justice Ginsburg moved the ball forward ever so gradually. Unlike Reed, this was not a challenge to an antiquated outlier state statute, but to a federal law in everyday use. It was also a case that cut to the heart of sex stereotypes. The facts involved an inversion of traditional gender roles with the woman as breadwinner and the husband as dependent. The court was forced to decide whether a law that relied on increasingly outdated notions about gender could be defended on that basis. Ginsburg, the oral advocate, was as compelling as Ginsburg, the brief writer. She identified the stakes in stark terms. This was a law she told the court from the podium that helps keep woman in her place, a place inferior to that occupied by men in our society. She made a forceful push, again, for subjecting gender-based classifications to strict scrutiny. And she skewered arguments that women did not need judicial protection because of their numerical superiority. Surely, she said, no one would suggest that race is not a suspect criterion in the District of Columbia because the black population here outnumbers the white. To those of us who occasionally have to lean in to hear Justice Ginsburg's questions from the bench, this oral argument is a reminder that Justice Ginsburg has forcefulness to spare when she wants it. The argument went well enough that afterwards, former Dean Griswold, who was by then Solicitor General of the United States, came over to congratulate her. It was as if to say, Justice Ginsburg later recounted, you're okay. <laughs> now I'm claiming you. <laughs> the court ruled eight to one in Frontiero's favor. Justice Ginsburg won most of her cases. The lead opinion of four justices reads like a Ginsburg brief and was clearly inspired by it. It bemoaned the paternalistic attitude that had once been far firmly rooted in our national consciousness. Through citations to literature, history, and sociology, it recounted the mistreatment of women. And through statistics and common sense, it showed how misguided any defense of this discriminatory law was. Four justices would have adopted Justice Ginsburg's invitation to subject sex classification to strict scrutiny and a fifth indicated his willingness to do so in an appropriate case. Justice Ginsburg finally achieved something close to that result three years later in Craig v. Boren. The law at issue there was a historical artifact, a curiosity, she called it, in the mold of Reed, but even more so. Oklahoma defined the age of majority for certain alcohol purchases as 21 for men, but 18 for women. Curtis Craig was a man under 21. He wanted beer, <laughs> and he sued to get it. <laughs> Justice Ginsburg filed a brief on Craig's behalf. It has long been remarked that part of the genius of Ginsburg as litigator was her careful client selection, and Craig was one of several men she represented. She has explained that this helped show that gender lines were harmful, not just to women, but also to men and children. This tactic occasionally picked up an extra vote from an otherwise hesitant judge. 
And it also served a deeper function. Laws that afforded women special treatment were often seen as favors to them. Illustrating this view, Justice Stewart once remarked that he thought it might be better for women if the Equal Rights Amendment were never ratified. That way, he said, women's rights groups would be free to challenge only those laws that gave them worse treatment while keeping the ones that benefited them. Justice Ginsburg's brief in Craig confronted this notion head on and demolished it. On the surface, she said, the law may appear to accord young women a liberty withheld from young men. But upon deeper inspection, she continued, the gender line drawn by Oklahoma is revealed as a manifestation of traditional attitudes about the expected behavior of males and females, part of the myriad signals and messages that daily underscore the notion of men as society's active members and of women as men's quiescent companions. She punctuated this with a citation to Simone de Beauvoir's Second Sex. How many of the justices do you think had read that? <laughs> the brief is also notable for a more subtle legal reason. Although Justice Ginsburg's previous briefs had argued full-throatedly for treating gender like race as a class subject to strict scrutiny, this brief was more restrained. Recognizing that the court had only been willing to meet her halfway, Justice Ginsburg now argued for a moderately heightened level of scrutiny for such laws, writing that they should be invalidated if they were based on overbroad generalizations about the sexes. That argument did the trick. The majority struck down the law, adopting a standard for gender-based classifications known as intermediate scrutiny. Justifying such laws on the basis of administrative convenience, or archaic and overbroad generalizations, or traditional notions of women's roles would no longer be possible. Soon after her triumphs in those cases, Justice Ginsburg was appointed to the DC Circuit by President Carter. Now I must admit I carry a minor grudge about Justice Ginsburg's tenure there. When I was a law student, I had the good fortune to be offered a clerkship by several of Justice Ginsburg's colleagues. Abner Mikva, whom I eventually clerked for, Harry Edwards, and Pat Wald. The only one of President Carter's nominees to the DC Circuit <laughs> who thought me not quite good enough <laughs> was Judge Ginsburg. Okay, let's be frank, she didn't even interview me. <laughs> Still, she overcame that loss too. <laughs> After over a decade of distinguished service on the DC Circuit, she was nominated to the Supreme Court by President Clinton and confirmed by the Senate 96 to three, the kind of vote that these days you'd assume was a misprint. <laughs> In her years on the court, she has issued, as I've said, countless great opinions. But I want to focus on three, two of them unfortunately dissents, that have brought into still sharper focus her transformational contributions to women's equality. Justice Ginsburg wrote the court's proudest women's rights opinion in 1996 in United States v. Virginia, the bobblehead case. The case arose out of an effort to admit women to the Virginia Military Institute, an incomparable military college, as Justice Ginsburg put it. For over 150 years, the school had been restricted to men. But in response to litigation, Virginia agreed to open a satellite school for women known as the Virginia Women's Institute for Leadership. This institute for leadership was nothing like the real deal. It employed less qualified faculty, offered fewer degrees, and did not give its students any opportunity to participate in the military training programs that made VMI great. The court had seen a case like this before. In 1950, the University of Texas Law School had argued that it could exclude African Americans from its flagship campus and place them in an unaccredited law school just for blacks. 
The court deemed that arrangement a violation of equal protection, understanding that the new school, unlike the flagship campus, had none of those qualities, and I'm quoting here, which are incapable of objective measurement, but which make for greatness in a law school. Yet in 1996, Virginia was arguing it could do the same thing to women. Justice Ginsburg, speaking for six justices, wrote the opinion deeming this arrangement unconstitutional. The opinion perfects many of the themes Justice Ginsburg had persuaded the court to weave into the law. Classifications based on sex could be upheld only if they had an exceedingly persuasive justification. Gender distinctions justified by broad generalizations about women or by supposed inherent differences or ostensibly benign efforts to help women could not stand. Applying these principles, Justice Ginsburg rejected Virginia's rationalizations that its system of single-sex schools was intended to provide a diversity of educational opportunities or to maintain the rigorous physical regimen at VMI. Drawing on a wealth of historical and sociological knowledge, she compared those explanations to reasons that bar associations once gave to exclude women from the practice of law, or police departments once offered to exclude women from their ranks. And she refused to accept any explanation based on what most women would prefer. Most men, she wryly noted, would also prefer not to be subjected to the physical rigors of VMI. <laughs> a point, she said, on which even our dissenting colleague, Justice Scalia, might agree. <laughs> the opinion is an exemplary piece of judicial craft. With her characteristic attention to detail, Justice Ginsburg meticulously explored the many facets of VMI and its sister school in order to illustrate the the profound differences between them. In articulating the standard governing gender equality claims, she synthesized a generation's worth of precedent and then, in the manner of a great common law judge, recast all those prior cases into the rule that there must be an exceedingly persuasive justification for any gender-based distinctions. Justice Ginsburg faced a vigorous dissent by Justice Scalia an experience that, as all my colleagues can attest, can be like facing down a locomotive. <laughs> Justice Ginsburg says that the dissent, written in Justice Scalia's characteristically powerful and riveting style, ruined her weekend. <laughs> but she also says it made her opinion better. And reading it, one is struck by how elegantly and effectively she responds to the many objections Justice Scalia raises, maintaining the flow and structure of her opinion without ever getting bogged down in squabbling. It's been 18 years since the VMI case, and some kinds of victories are now harder to come by. The law of gender equality, mind you, hasn't changed much in the interim. Reed, Frontiero, Craig, and VMI are still the constitutional touchstones, and Title VII of the Civil Rights Act still bars employers from discriminating on the basis of gender. But the court has somehow found reason to cut back on certain anti-discrimination protections. So I want to conclude my tour of Justice Ginsburg's greatest hits with two of her dissents. They show how she has remained dead right on the law and reality of gender discrimination even when the court has turned in the opposite direction. And at least one of them illustrates her ability to speak to people beyond the court in order to rectify the court's errors. Justice Ginsburg's dissent in Ledbetter v. Goodyear, another bobblehead case, has become iconic so that the facts of that case are now well known even to non-lawyers. Lily Ledbetter was a supervisor at a Goodyear plant in Alabama for almost 20 years. During that time, she came to be paid less and less than male co-workers doing the same work. Finally, after the pay differential between Ledbetter and her male co-workers opened up to nearly 40%, she sued. 
A jury found in Ledbetter's favor, and a judge ordered Goodyear to make up the difference in wages. But on appeal, a court of appeals threw out the judgment, and the Supreme Court affirmed. The legal issue may seem dry at first glance. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act allows individuals to sue for acts of discrimination only when they are less than six months old. In the view of five justices, Ledbetter was complaining about acts of discrimination that were many years old, denied raises, lost promotions, and the like. True, the court admitted, Ledbetter's paycheck week in and week out was lower than those of her male colleagues. But the court ruled that those skimpy paychecks were mere effects of past discrimination, and Ledbetter could not use them to satisfy the statute of limitations. Justice Ginsburg's dissent is remarkable for many things. First and foremost, of course, it is utterly correct. <laughs> Pay discrimination occurs repeatedly over time. The court long ago held that plaintiffs can challenge a pattern of discrimination each time a new discriminatory act occurs. So here, Ledbetter was within her rights to challenge Goodyear's wage discrimination each time it sent her a paycheck that treated her differently because of her sex. In her years as a lawyer, Justice Ginsburg had often found herself in the position of arguing the judges should change the law to protect women from unequal treatment. But in this case, she didn't need to urge that kind of change. Congress and the Supreme Court had already created a world of legal rules, much like the ones Justice Ginsburg had originally envisioned. So in Ledbetter, Justice Ginsburg was asking merely for a faithful application of the courts and Congress's prior decisions. It was the majority that was changing the rules by retreating from the decisions the court and Congress had already made. In explaining the majority's errors, Justice Ginsburg's dissent characteristically cuts through the clutter. With limpid prose, perfect diction, it gives life and immediacy to a seemingly arcane legal issue. Every page bristles with understanding of the realities of gender discrimination in the workplace. Pay disparities, Justice Ginsburg wrote, often occur, as they did in Ledbetter's case, in small increments. Small initial discrepancies, she stated, may not be seen as meat for a federal case, particularly when the employee trying to succeed in a non-traditional environment is averse to making waves. But, Justice Ginsburg continued, an employee's initial readiness to give her employer the benefit of the doubt should not preclude her from later challenging the then current and continuing payment of a wage depressed on account of her sex. I suspect that when Justice Ginsburg wrote those words, she remembered her own discrimination, her own experience of pay discrimination as a young professor at Rutgers and her battle on behalf of plaintiffs like Lieutenant Frontiero. Perhaps most famously, Justice Ginsburg's dissent ends with a clarion call for legislative action. She told me several years ago in a public conversation I had with her at Harvard Law School that this dissent was directed squarely at Congress. The dissent, she told me, was saying, you could not have meant what this court said you meant, so fix it. And that is what Congress did. Justice Ginsburg's opinion was possibly the most effective dissent of this generation. It instantly turned Ledbetter into a national figure and thrust equal pay into the forefront of public debate. Less than two years later, in 2009, Congress enacted and President Obama signed as one of his first pieces of business the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. That law adopted precisely the theory put forward in Justice Ginsburg's dissent. Now the statute of limitations for challenging pay discrimination restarts with each new discriminatory paycheck, as it always should have. Finally, I want to conclude my tour of Justice Ginsburg's opinions with another dissent. It is more recent, from only last term, and it is a dissent I joined. The case was Vance v. Ball State University, and the issue is not terribly hard to grasp. Under anti-discrimination law, an employer is responsible for workplace harassment perpetrated by a supervisor. 
but it was not completely settled who qualified as a supervisor. It could be anyone who exercised substantial control over employees. The other option was it was only someone who could formally fire, demote, or transfer an employee. The plaintiff in the case was an African-American woman, Mayetta Vance, who worked as a catering assistant and who alleged that a catering specialist who oversaw her work but did not have formal power to fire her had harassed her on the basis of her race. The court dismissed Vance's suit. That may have been the right result. It was possible that the person Vance said was harassing her wasn't her supervisor under any definition. The real problem was the court's reasoning. The majority said that only individuals with hiring, firing, or similar power could qualify as supervisors. It thought that was the simplest rule, and so the best one. Justice Ginsburg filed, wrote a dissent, joined by three other justices. In my humble opinion, it had the majority dead to rights. Supervisors who can threaten employees with inferior or demeaning work assignments are fully as capable of intimidating, harassing, and abusing them as supervisors with formal power to demote or transfer. Just as in Ledbetter, this conclusion followed readily from our prior cases, holding employers liable for the acts of supervisors. And just as in Ledbetter, knowledge of the realities of workplace discrimination showed how blinkered the the majority's contrary rule was. When I first picked up the briefs in the case, I thought about how professors can harass their secretaries, even though they have no formal power to fire them. And an embracing part of the opinion, Justice Ginsburg illustrated, through a series of litigated cases, just how often that kind of harassment can occur. And so, how much workplace discrimination the majority's rule would allow. But in this dissent, too, what is perhaps most notable is its closing. As in Ledbetter, Justice Ginsburg ends by calling on Congress to intervene, to correct the court's wayward interpretation of Title VII, citing a long litany of cases in which the court adopted parsimonious interpretations of Title VII that Congress later had to reject and correct. The passage seems a bit wearied, as if to say, haven't we been through all this before? But it also has the sound of a boxer jumping back into the ring for another round. Others who fought so long and hard might have grown frustrated with disappointments a fight for equality entails. But as anyone who knows her can tell you, as the trainer whom we share, as Justice Ginsburg <laughs> told you, often tells me, Justice Ginsburg is indefatigable. <laughs> it's been said of Thurgood Marshall that he would have been a giant of American law even if he had never been a Supreme Court justice. As Justice Ginsburg's greatest hits make clear, the same is true of her, although she has brilliantly extended those contributions as a judge. More than any other single individual, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is responsible for a limiting sex discrimination from American law. How has she done it? One of the constants of Justice Ginsburg's style, extending from the Reed brief in 1971 to the Vance dissent in 2013, has been a keen attention to the realities of gender discrimination. Partly, no doubt, this comes from personal experience, the slights at Harvard, the doors that shut on her when she graduated, the pay discrimination at Rutgers. It also must come from her many years listening to and fighting for other women who suffered from even greater discrimination. As a litigator, she used this knowledge to rebut every outdated rationalization thrown up to defend gender discrimination. And she relied on it to give the court a full understanding of the injustices she was seeking to correct. As a justice, too, she constantly returns to the realities of discrimination to show how to correctly apply anti-discrimination principles. Another equally important feature of Justice Ginsburg's approach 
has been her sensitivity to the role of courts in our democracy. Now that may seem paradoxical for a person who led a law reform movement, but it was and is a crucial part of her thinking. At our Harvard conversation, she told me, and I'm quoting her words, that courts are reactive institutions. They are not out in the vanguard of any social movement. While they can put their imprimatur on the side of change, she said, they cannot lead it. Her work as a litigator and as a justice has reflected her understanding of this delicate balance. As a lawyer, she urged and sometimes shamed the court to catch up with the events occurring outside its doors. But she also recognized that change could not come all at once. She chose her clients, her cases, and her targets with exquisite care to avoid pushing the court too far too fast. In much the same way, as a justice, she has often been a temperamental conservative who prefers the gradual common law approach to the sweeping rule or unnecessary holding. She has been critical of certain cases, most notably Roe v. Wade, for having ruled too expansively and too quickly. But she also recognizes that when the time is right, courts can play an important role in ratifying society's progress, and that a well-placed dissent can become an important spur to justice. And there is a third piece of the Ginsburg style, one that, be, that has become especially impressive to me <coughs> since I joined the court, and that is simple mastery of legal craft. That appears in the appellate briefs she wrote as a lawyer, which are models of precision, clarity, and power. And so too, her opinions reflect this great, apparently inborn gift. Each opinion is crystalline, exact, and elegant. Every word is carefully chosen and perfectly apt, every sentence well considered, every argument organized, coherent, and to the point. You're never afraid that a stray word or thought will cause some unforeseen bad consequence down the road. Of all the justices, Justice Ginsburg drafts her opinions the most quickly, yet when I read them, I'm always struck by how error-free and polished they are. We have a practice of inviting others to comment on our opinions and ask for changes. I almost never have anything to say about Justice Ginsburg's. They are ready to be published the moment they are circulated. She is the archetypal judge's judge, and every time I read one of her opinions, I feel as though I learn how to do my job a little better. Justice Ginsburg has also taught me something more personal. Being a member of an institution like the Supreme Court isn't always easy. We disagree about a lot of things of great import, matters on which we all feel deeply. It's a crucial part of the job not to take those disagreements personally. Partly that's because there's always another case. And if we're to remain open to persuasion and also able to persuade others, we need to stay on good terms. But partly, it's because the court is an important institution, an institution that the country needs to work. And it's just not going to function well if its members aren't able to cooperate. No one performs that difficult role better than Justice Ginsburg. She's second to no one in her convictions about what the law requires and what justice demands but she's also a model of respect and collegiality with every member of the court. She manages to be universally admired and beloved by me, by Justice Scalia, by everyone in between. <laughs> Without sacrificing an iota of her principles or convictions, she told me once that her secret comes in part from something her mother-in-law told her back when she and Marty were young. What's the secret to a successful marriage, she asked. Sometimes her mother-in-law said, it pays to be a little deaf. 
Sometimes it pays to be a little deaf around the court, too. <laughs> and Justice Ginsburg knows just when to do that. I've seen Justice Ginsburg maintain those values of collegiality even when it's toughest. Our tradition at the court, and it's usually a lovely, lovely tradition, is to have lunch together after the conferences in which we discuss and vote on cases. The rule at those lunches is no more caught court talk, just friendly conversation about sports and movies and music and things like that. Now, without giving any specifics, I can tell you that I once left a difficult conference, maybe the most difficult since I joined the court. And I found it almost impossible to imagine going to lunch with my colleagues. <laughs> we just had a very serious disagreement about a very tough issue. And I wasn't so inclined to immediately switch that off and chat about the movies. I told Justice Ginsburg that I didn't think I would go. She was understanding, but quite firm. You have to go, she said. <laughs> you have to act as though nothing has just happened. Her temperament, her maturity and judgment, her calmness and wisdom help make the court the institution it is. And of course, when the notorious RBG tells you to go to lunch, <laughs> you go. <laughs> and so I went. One last story, this one coming from one of my clerks. A few months ago, the court held a, a seminar of sorts on women in the law for the women law clerks. The speakers discussed balancing work and family as well as dealing with gender discrimination in the workplace, issues that are still present but almost unimaginably different than in Justice Ginsburg's law school days when the very idea of a woman Supreme Court clerk was fanciful. Towards the end of the event, Justice Ginsburg surprised everyone by walking into the room to answer questions. As soon as she entered, one of my law clerks told me, all of these young women stood up and applauded. It was like seeing a legend walk in the door, my law clerk said. I know that I'm her colleague and not one of her army of 20-something groupies. <laughs> but every day, I feel much the same way. When I see Justice Ginsburg walk down the halls, I think I am seeing a hero. She has done as much as anyone in the last 40 years to make America a more equal and just society. It is a tremendous honor to sit on the same bench as her, knowing how much she has contributed to my life, and much more importantly, to the lives of millions of women around the world. Thank you, Justice Ginsburg. Thank you, everyone. Um, that was wonderful. So I, I think, I hope we have time for just a few questions. And I believe that uh, it will be permissible to pose questions to either of the two justices, if that's OK with them. Um, the uh, crowd in the room and the technology in the room is such that if you do have a question, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand, to stand up, and to uh, ask your question as loudly and clearly as possible. If, if necessary, I will uh, rephrase or rearticulate the question. Um, and again, we have limited time. It's getting late. I think it's still snowing. But uh, if anyone has a question, please raise your hand and we'll try to deal with it. Right there. Thank you.
I've been asked to repeat the question, which I'll try to do. The question is in the Virginia, because not everyone could, un could hear, that's why. Uh, the question was in the Virginia uh, case, um, Justice Ginsburg's uh, language uh, identified reasons to celebrate the differences, am I right, between uh, men and women, and the question is why use the, the word celebrate when there are so many things in the fact pattern at issue that were not worth celebrating. Is that the question? It's a tough one. Justice Ginsburg? <laughs> well, it, don't you agree that it is something to celebrate that we have a world made up of both men and women? I um, mean, I'm very, I celebrate that I have a daughter and a son. Um, my life, as my colleague mentioned, was enormously enriched by picking the right life, life partner. So what I meant to say, we are not alike. We don't look alike, men and women. We look different. Um, well, the world couldn't go on if there weren't both of us. <laughs> Other questions in the back? I don't think that needs to bear repeating, so. I have enjoyed everything I have done in the law. But what has made me so satisfied with my career is what Justice Kagan spoke about, that I spent a lot of my time doing something outside myself doing something that I hope makes life better for, for people who are not as fortunate. So you will have a skill that you can use to make a living, but also to help make things a little better for other people, to repair tears in your communities. We should ask the once great dean because she must have been telling students all the time. <laughs> well, it turns out that Justice Ginsburg could have been a great dean, too, because that's what I would have said. In the VMI case, one of the best friend of the court briefs was filed by the Seven Sister Colleges. There was nothing the state of Virginia offered to its women that could compare with VMI. So a state can't make an opportunity available only to women or only to men. My daughter went to an all-girls school from Jane from kindergarten through 12th grade. I think that the school she went to was the best school in the city of New York. So VMI was not about single-sex schools. It was about a state providing an opportunity to one sex only. By the way, there is one person in this room who knows about pack marking, and that is Gunilla. Gunilla Ask, my Swedish friend. <laughs> um, <laughs> Gunilla, do you remember Dag um book? It was called Vague Lading, and so that's the closest I could come to, to as a translation of that. 
and again, I agree with everything that Justice Ginsburg said about single-sex schools with, with, with one exception, because I went to the best single-sex <laughs> school <laughs> in New York City. Hunter High School was at that time, was at that time, was at that time single sex. So, sorry, Jane, but. <laughs> Other questions in the back in the red? That's kind of a low bar. <laughs> is what can individual women do, generally speaking, not as Supreme Court justices, but to even the playing field, even still in the community as it still needs to be done? Correct? Well, if you find the place, the audience, that needs a little education, you give it to them. I mean, that was, uh, I am a little worried that the gains that women have made, uh, have, have slowed, and they could even be a backslide. I wonder why today's young women don't seem to be as fired up as the women in my generation were about assuring that women have, as, have an equal chance to aspire to follow their dream. Although the women who have made you into a hip hop icon. <laughs> no, I think uh, you know sometimes maybe younger women don't don't uh, don't appreciate how hard uh, how hard the struggle has been, right? And maybe maybe don't always appreciate it as much because of that. But you know, I think uh, it's a great question, and I think you know different people find themselves in different positions and different roles and, and there is, uh, there's no one right answer for, 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 any, for any, uh, everybody. So uh, it's great that you're asking the question. I'd like to ask you a question. And it's, <laughs> if you watched the Super Bowl as I did not. Um, <laughs> how did Renee Fleming oh, yeah. do this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good. It must have been freezing out on that field. <laughs> You seize the opportunity to correct people who have the wrong idea. And I've done that in an in opinion or two. I think maybe two more questions if we could. Blue? Yeah. Well, I don't know what Elena's view is on that question. Uh, there's one aspect of it, though, that perhaps the public doesn't notice as much. What we do in the main is not seen 
in the courtroom. Before we come on the bench to hear a case, we have read the opinions that the other judges, the other judges who've passed on the same question, we read their opinions. We read the party's briefs. We read umpteen friend of the court briefs, the precedent in point. If there is a good law journal article, we have read that. We come armed to the teeth for the argument. But what the public will see is two people given a half hour aside and having a conversation with the justices and may come away with the idea, well, the best debater is going to win that contest. It, it would give a false impression of the appellate process to think that the oral argument is what is decisive in most cases. It's not, it's not like a trial where you, you see it's all, it's all happening there, the witness is testifying. The, the hard, hard, hard work is done back in our chambers. I think it's, it's a really hard issue. I've actually taken all sides of this position at different times. <laughs> Uh, uh, but you know, there's uh, you know, obviously there are reasons to have cameras. Transparency is an important thing in government institutions, and for the most part, I think that the court would look pretty good if people saw what we do up there. But I think it's actually, uh, I, I, you know, uh, nine people who come prepared every single day. Important cases, less important cases, who are thoughtful and smart and really trying to get the questions right all nine of us. And so, so I think uh, when people come to the court, it's actually kind of, uh, kind of impressive, actually. Uh, when I was Solicitor General, I would come to the court not only in the cases that I argued, but whenever somebody in my office argued a case. So I would sit there case in and case out and watch the way the court worked. And I always I remember thinking, it would be great if every American had the chance to see this, because I think we're an institution that works, and, um, and that it would be good for people to see that. But I, I do agree with Justice Ginsburg that there are all kinds of opportunities for people to misunderstand a little bit the nature of, 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 of what we do and to take snippets of conversation in an, in an argument taken out of context and think that that's what won or lost the case. And, and, uh, and, and that would be a very unfortunate thing. So I don't know, what do you, so it's a good example of what you see depending a little bit on where you sit. When, when um, I think uh, as I've as I've served on the court, uh, I've 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 um, I've I've come to see more than I once did uh, the reasons why maybe cameras would not be such a good idea that they would uh, actually uh, uh, in ad in addition to what Justice Ginsburg said that it might actually change the proceedings themselves. Uh, I think people sort of naturally ham a little bit when cameras are on them or, or, or speak in sound bites a little bit more than they otherwise might. So I, I think it's something, I think we're going to have to become more transparent, uh, uh, but I'm not necessarily sure that putting a camera in for every argument is the way to do it right now. One more question. <laughs> I'm not going to try to repeat that question. <laughs> Adamla was a case about Argentina in the bad days of the Dirty War, where atrocities had been committed by the government, and the charge brought by Argentinians was that Damler's affiliate 
in Argentina collaborated with the government to kill or injure some of the employees. Do you think that that was the suit that belonged in the United States? I mean, Daimler makes its cars in Germany. Argentina is where it all happened. Both of them were available places where suit could be brought. Is it appropriate? Do you think it would be appropriate for the United States to be the arbiter? to be the forum in which that case is heard. I admit I was sipping the uh, Justice Sotomayor Kool-Aid of the dissent on this one, and I thought that in light of the 2.4% um, uh, doing business and the agency theory that was conceded, that, that yes, the claim of jurisdiction should have should have stood. Now, well, then we would be um, the court for the world, because every large corporation could be sued in every state in the United States on that theory. And that would make us look uh, rather arrogant to our nations, to other nations in the world community who have uh, the kind of attitude toward jurisdiction. And I must say that I first began to think about these questions when I was studying civil procedure in Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> where the notion was, you don't bring a suit where you happen to grab the person who committed the wrong. But it depends on where it happened, uh, where the events in suit occurred is the logical place for the suit to be brought. Uh, we were asked before about uh, giving advice. And my last piece of advice is, don't mess around with Justice Ginsburg when it comes to personal jurisdiction. <laughs> Thanks again to both justices. Thanks you all for coming and get home safely. Thank you. <laughs>